Hi, I'm Clarice Tinsley on a windy day in Dallas. You may have seen me for more than 40 years on KDFW Fox 4 in Dallas-Fort Worth. I'm a migrant to North Texas. Detroit, Michigan is my hometown. I came to Dallas in 1978 to anchor the 10 p.m. newscast and report for KDFW. I came here from my work, as so many migrants have. This documentary tells the story of Dallas through five historic waves of migration to this area. Each wave brought different groups of migrating people. Some were immigrants. Others migrated from elsewhere in the United States. Some were forced to come here. Some chose to come here. You may be able to locate yourself or your ancestors in these five waves of migration. And if you migrated here as I did, then your story is part of the story we tell in What Follows. This video will describe five historic waves of migration into the Dallas area. First, native peoples of the area, nomadic peoples of the American prairies. Second, a wave of early African American and British American migrants in the period 1841 to 1872. Third, a wave of European migrants that began with the Reunion Colony in 1855, expanded after the coming of railroads to Dallas in 1872, and lasted until about 1908. Fourth, a complex wave of migration in the period between 1908 and 1965 that resolves into three distinct but simultaneous wavelets, a group of business leaders who immigrated from all over the central and eastern United States, a group of Mexican immigrants fleeing the instability of the Mexican Revolution, and a group of poor white and black laborers, mostly from the rural south. And then, fifth, a new wave of global migration that followed the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965 and brought peoples from Asia, Africa, and the Middle East to the Dallas area. The first migrants to the Dallas area were native prairie peoples. They were the first wave of migrants. Were they really migrants? They were, in the sense that the prairie natives were nomadic peoples who might settle in an area long enough for a growing season, but then moved on, typically leaving very little evidence of their settlements. Native peoples had come to this area from at least 12,000 years ago, and probably before then. Archaeologists describe a distinctive culture of Southern Plains villagers who lived on the southern ranges of North American prairies. They developed a way of life that combined hunting and gathering food with small-scale cultivation of corn and other crops. The Southern Plains villagers were almost certainly the ancestors of peoples who call themselves Wichita today. From at least 400 years ago, people identified with the Wichita tribe had moved south in the prairies, and from about 300 years ago, they were living in the North Texas area. When archaeologists have found native burials in the Dallas area, it's the Wichita and affiliated tribes who come to honor the remains. Caddo peoples historically lived east of the Dallas area in what's now East Texas and Western Louisiana but they had begun to move out on the prairies in advance of encroaching United States frontier. They had come into the Dallas area by the 1700s. Comanche people also roamed the same wide areas where Wichita and Caddo traveled, and the Tonkawa, a group that seems to have traveled in the same area as the Wichita, also came to the Dallas area. Other groups came here from the east, and Adarko people, part of the old Caddo Confederacy, and even a group of Cherokees who had traveled for decades from their homelands far to the east were present in the Dallas area when the second wave of settlers arrived. Native peoples persisted in North Texas, including the Dallas area, through the 1880s. By that decade, almost all of the Wichita and Caddo, including the Anadarko people, had been removed to reservations in Caddo County, Oklahoma, but there are Native American people in the Dallas area today, including some descendants of Wichita and Caddo people, 
as a result of the Indian Relocation Act of 1956 that allowed them to leave reservations and participate more broadly in American society. Well, I came here in uh, 1968 and from a uh, rural area to, to here. And uh, of course, overall, 1968 was a very exciting time. I, was going to, I just graduated from high school. I was all set to go to school, go to college here in Oklahoma. And at the, at the last second thought, we, I applied to SMU here and uh, got accepted that, that summer, right before the class started. And I've, I've been here in this area ever since. What impressed me about Dallas was that they washed the streets. The streets were washed, I would say, every morning. And it was clean. And the people I saw were dressed very well. And from where I came from, I didn't see anything like that. So that was very impressive to me. And uh, I stayed. Native Americans are here, they're living among you. We're not all the same. Uh, we're part of you. We're contributing uh, in our own way. Uh, and we're not uh, some historic figures or from, from the amount of history we're, we're living today. The second wave of migration into the Dallas area began in 1841 when John Neely Bryan moved from Arkansas and settled on the banks of the Trinity River where Dealey Plaza is today. This wave of migrants included British American settlers moving from the United States to the Republic of Texas and then to the state of Texas. It also included enslaved Americans of African ancestry. The first U.S. Census of Dallas County in 1850 reveals a lot about this wave of migration. The largest numbers of heads of household came from Tennessee, Virginia, Kentucky, Illinois, North Carolina, Ohio, and Missouri. Very few in this period came from the Deep South. The states from which these early settlers came indicate a very particular group of migrants. Scots-Irish migrants to the British colonies of North America between 1715 and 1775, a group that involved migrants not only from Ireland and Scotland, but from the northern English counties that bordered on Scotland as well. They tended to arrive through the port of Philadelphia, moved westward across southern Pennsylvania, then turned left at Gettysburg or Chambersburg to enter the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, the Virginia backcountry of those days. In the early 19th century, Scots-Irish migrants joined other American settlers and moved into Kentucky, Tennessee, and southern Illinois, crossing the Mississippi into Missouri after the Louisiana Purchase. From there, they could connect to the system of crude paths we have come to call the Shawnee Trail, stretching from central Missouri through a corner of Kansas, then down into Oklahoma and into northern Texas. Others took the Arkansas Trail that extended down from Missouri to southwestern Arkansas, where they could connect with the Red River and follow it upstream to trails that led to the Dallas area. There was some southern English influence in the early Dallas area, because the corporation licensed by the Republic of Texas to meet out land grants in the area was organized by a native of Devon, William S. Peters, and he had a board of directors who seemed to have come from southern England, including London. But we're inclined to see the early British American settlers to the Dallas area as having a core of people that looked like the Scots-Irish group. The earliest Christian congregations organized in the Dallas area after they began to settle it were those typical of Scots-Irish and English cultures as they had evolved in America. Presbyterians, Baptists, Methodists, 
and the distinctly American tradition that would become the Disciples of Christ and Churches of Christ. Early settlers brought enslaved people with them to the Dallas area. The U.S. Census for 1850 revealed that out of a total population of 2,743 persons in Dallas County, 207 were enslaved. By 1860, the population of Dallas County had reached 8,665, and 1,074 of these were enslaved. The percentage of enslaved people had been about 8% in 1850, and then 12% in 1860. Slavery persisted in the Dallas area until it officially ended in Texas on June 19, 1865. At the time of emancipation, formerly enslaved people were advised to remain in their accustomed places. But they didn't. In the Dallas area, newly emancipated people clustered in freedmen's communities, one of them just north of downtown adjoining the state Thomas residential area. In freedmen's communities, they began organizing their own social structures, including businesses, schools, Masonic organizations, and Baptist and Methodist congregations. A third wave of migration into the Dallas area involved European peoples, who arrived mostly after the railroads came to Dallas in 1872 and 1873. But there was a colorful forerunner to this wave of European migration, and that was the Reunion Colony founded in 1855 across the river west of downtown Dallas. This was not the only idealistic settlement in North Texas involving French-speaking people. A similar colony was founded in Denton County. Inspired by the utopian and communalistic teachings of Francois-Marie Charles Fouillet and books about Texas, an initial group of about 200 French and French-speaking Swiss and Belgian colonists, led by Victor Considerant, disembarked at Galveston and then walked over land to Dallas, arriving in April 1855. Can you imagine them walking and camping along the entire 284 miles of what is now I-45 from Galveston to Dallas in 1855? The colony, they called La Réunion, had about 350 settlers by the next year, but it didn't last. The settlers had little expertise in agriculture and chose poor land in the Trinity Bottom and in the Chalk Hills that rise out of the Trinity in West Dallas. By the end of January 1857, they formally disbanded the colony, but many of them remained in Dallas. They appeared in the next censuses, they greeted newly arriving European folks in the 1870s, and they gave the city of Dallas an international flavor that set it apart in the Southwest. The first railroad arrived in Dallas in 1872, and it was joined in the next year with the intersection of another railroad. By the end of 1873, railroads connected Dallas to Galveston, Houston, and St. Louis. The city and county expanded rapidly from this time, as census figures indicate. The population of the county almost tripled between 1870 and 1880, and then doubled again between 1880 and 1890. Many of the newcomers to Dallas in this period came from elsewhere in the United States, but many had been born in Europe, Britain, and Ireland, as census figures show. The largest immigrant group by far had been born in Germany. By 1910, more than 1,700 residents of Dallas County were German-born. The latter decades of the 1800s had been the period of the Franco-Prussian War, when thousands of Germans sought refuge in North America, so many that Prussia established a consulate in Galveston. Dallas saw new beer gardens established in the city and heard oompa bands, and, most unfortunately, had to tolerate accordion music as well. Jews arrived in Dallas with the first trains and proceeded to organize businesses, synagogues, and benevolent associations. The census reports also show new immigrants born in England and Ireland and France as well. And by the end of the century, immigrants were arriving in Dallas from Italy, Switzerland, and Sweden. At the same time as these European and British migrants were arriving, Dallas saw an influx of population from the southern United States and in this period, from the Deep South. 
This was due to the booming cotton economy of the Dallas area. The old Shawnee Trail was no longer functioning as a cattle trail. The newer Chisholm Trail had gone through Fort Worth instead of Dallas, and Fort Worth remained a western town, where the west begins. The rich, dark soil around Dallas, broken by a plow blade newly introduced by Cyrus McCormick, expanded cotton farming, giving rise to a flourishing cotton economy. Eventually, this meant not only that Dallas area people were raising cotton crops, but also that Dallas became a center for cotton-related businesses, such as the Continental Gin Company that manufactured cotton gin components, and the Murray Company that built cotton gins and cotton presses. The cotton economy brought a new wave of black and white workers to Dallas, agricultural workers as well as industrial workers, simultaneous with the arrivals of European peoples. The advent of white Americans from the Deep South to Dallas in this time meant that Dallas became more truly southernized than earlier in its history. It was in this period, especially from the 1890s, that the United Daughters of the Confederacy intent on protecting the honor of their fathers and grandfathers, began to build public monuments in Dallas to Confederate leaders. All of this must have been genuinely baffling to Dallas's newly arriving European immigrants in the same period. One sign of the new migrant communities of this period was a growingly diverse group of worship spaces they built in Dallas. Dallas Jews in this period built synagogues representing the Reform tradition, Temple Emmanuel, the Orthodox tradition, Tiferet Israel, and the conservative tradition, Shi'aret Israel. Some of the Reunion families were Catholic, and they were soon joined by Catholics from Irish, Italian, German, and Swiss families. By 1902, Catholics had organized the Diocese of Dallas and dedicated the red brick Victorian Gothic Cathedral that now stands on the corner of Ross Avenue and Pearl Street. Methodist, Baptist, and Presbyterian churches continued to flourish and were joined in the mid-1800s by Episcopal, Congregational, and Lutheran churches, the latter including Dallasites of German and Scandinavian ancestry. Now it gets even more complicated. The fourth wave of migrants came in the period from about 1908 through 1965, but in reality, there were at least three overlapping groups of migrants in the same time frame. So we will call them three simultaneous wavelets in this period. One of these simultaneous wavelets of migrants, call it 4.1, consisted of business leaders coming into the Dallas area in the early 20th century. In 1911, the United States government decided, after some serious politicking by local leaders, to locate a southwestern branch of the Federal Reserve Bank in Dallas. This decision established Dallas as a banking center in the southwest, and that spurred the growth of Dallas banking and other businesses, including the business infrastructures of the newly emerging petroleum industry. The first generation of these petroleum business leaders were typically from Texas and southern states. Oil tycoon Clint Murkison Sr. was from nearby Athens, Texas. H.L. Hunt was from southern Illinois, and he had come to Texas by way of Arkansas. Everett Lee de Gaulier, who pioneered the science of proven reserves of oil, was born in Kansas and educated in Oklahoma. If Jock and Ellie Ewing from the first Dallas television series had actually existed, they would fit this pattern of southern folks who moved to Dallas with the oil industry but remained tied to their rural and agricultural roots. Dallas also began to attract business and civic leaders from farther afield in the United States in the early 20th century. Architect George Dahl, who had been born in Minneapolis of Norwegian immigrant parents, moved to Dallas in 1926 and developed modernist buildings in the city, including the extensive Art Deco buildings of the Texas Centennial Exposition of 1936. J. Eric Johnson represented a similar pattern to Dahl. 
Born in Brooklyn, New York to Swedish immigrant parents, he moved to Dallas in 1934 to work for Geophysical Services, originally a petroleum-related corporation. During the Second World War, Geophysical Services shifted its focus to electronics. Johnson became president of the company in 1951, and in that year, the corporate name was changed to Texas Instruments. Johnson would also serve as mayor of Dallas in a crucial period in the 1960s after the Kennedy assassination, laying out ambitious goals for Dallas. The petroleum industry in Dallas did not supply a lot of outlets for labor. Since it was the business infrastructures of the oil business that were located in Dallas, but not oil and gas production. The same was true of high-tech industries like Texas Instruments and Collins Radio. The older cotton industry did continue to attract agricultural as well as industrial workers into the 20th century, and new industries developed in Dallas in this period that attracted labor. Four of them had the name Trinity. Trinity Farms, known as the Rancho Grande by its Mexican-American workers, was a large operation from the early 1900s that comprised about 5,000 acres in the Trinity River bottomland, mostly on the west side of the river between Hampton and Westmoreland today. They harvested and sold pecans and fruit, among other agricultural products. That corporation spawned the Trinity Farms Construction Company that won the contract to build the levees on the Trinity River in Dallas between 1928 and 1932. The Trinity Portland Cement Company originated around the same time and utilized local limestone to make cement. Their plant, located out west on what's now Singleton Avenue, was so huge that it spawned an independently incorporated town romantically named Cement City. The Trinity Steel Company, today it's called Trinity Industries, was also located in West Dallas and originally manufactured steel tanks. The cotton industry companies, all of these Trinity companies, and other industries like them in West Dallas and Oak Cliff and Southern Dallas needed labor. Large-scale works projects like the building of the Dallas levees, the improvements to White Rock Lake, the building of the Texas Centennial Exposition of 1936, and the building of the Triple Underpass and Dealey Plaza all called for a huge labor pool and they found workers not only in the existing working class populations of Dallas, but also in two newly arriving groups that we'll describe as the second and third wavelets of Dallas migration in the early 20th century. One of these wavelets of migration, we'll call it 4.2, consisted of Mexican-born people moving to Dallas in the early 20th century, fleeing the instability of the Mexican Revolution. Earlier Dallas censuses had shown only a handful of people born in Mexico. In 1910, roughly the year in which the Mexican Revolution began, the federal census for Dallas County showed 305 people born in Mexico. Ten years later, that number had swelled to 3,281. But the 1930 census shows only 90 persons born in Mexico. Do you think that more than 3,000 Mexican-born people left Dallas in the 1920s? That's not likely. The rise of anti-immigrant views in the United States in the 1920s, epitomized in the second rise of the Ku Klux Klan in that decade with its virulent anti-immigrant views, had led to a program of deportations of Mexican citizens from the United States. The word on the street was, don't tell them you were born in Mexico. In fact, it's likely that all the census numbers for Mexican-born immigrants in this period were deflated. The 1940 census for Dallas County showed almost 2,600 Mexican-born residents, and again, probably a lower number than the real numbers of Mexican-born people in Dallas. Mexican immigrants to Dallas in the early 20th century settled on both sides of the Trinity River. One area along Harry Hines Boulevard came to be called Little Mexico. The El Phoenix Restaurant, opened on Mexican Independence Day, September 16th in 1918, is about the last remaining sign of this community. My grandfather arrived in Dallas in 1910. He was 20 years old. So it was a chance for him to make more money and a better life for his mother and his sister who was challenged. 
my grandmother and her family, it was a large family also of, of eight people, uh, they came uh, when my grandmother was 14 years old. That would have been uh, 1914. And uh, they came away to get away, that came to get away from the revolution. It started out as a, uh, a little cafe in the front room of their house, uh, 1916. And uh, they served food that my grandfather had learned to prepare just by watching uh, the chef at the old Oriental Hotel in downtown Dallas. My grandfather was a pot scrubber, but he was able to get an idea of how you put the food together and cooked it. And uh, he decided uh, that he would open his own place. Uh, and again, in, like I said, in the front room of his house and serve what he had learned, things like Oysters Rockefeller uh, to the people that came in. Uh, what he would do is he had the food that he prepared for the customers. Then, as they do today here at El Phoenix, in the kitchen, they have kitchen food. Dishes that are things that their families have eaten for years and years and years. So my grandfather in the early, early years would be making this food and uh, the customers would be smelling it. And they'd say, well, what's going on back there? And he would say, would you like to try it? And he'd bring it and they tasted it and they liked it. And so it was kind of a conspiratorial thing that uh, the early customers of El Phoenix encouraged him to enlarge that menu and to offer it to, to them. We say that he is one of the pioneers of Tex-Mex and many of the core items uh, in restaurants, uh, the core items of their menus are things that my grandfather originated. The third simultaneous wavelet of migration in the early 20th century, let's call it wavelet 4.3, continued the migration of poor black and white southerners to Dallas, now attracted not so much to the old cotton economy as to Dallas's new industries and works projects. This was the period of the great migration of black Americans from the south, but it was also a period that saw the migration of white as well as black Americans from rural areas to cities in the south and elsewhere. Dallas was no exception. The Civilian Conservation Corps had a labor camp at White Rock Lake from the 1930s until the beginning of World War II. The Works Projects Administration sponsored a number of labor projects in Dallas, including the building of Dealey Plaza. The Trinity Portland Cement Company and Trinity Farms employed black, white, and Mexican-American workers, segregated into separate living areas in this period. The families of Bonnie Parker and Clyde Barrow epitomize the story of poor people from Texas and other areas moving to Dallas in this period. Bonnie Parker had been born south of Abilene, but moved with her mother to her grandparents' home in Cement City when she was four years old. Clyde Barrow had been born in Ellis County, south of Dallas, and moved with his family to West Dallas as a child in the 1920s. Bonnie had been married a little before her 16th birthday, and met Clyde in 1930 while her husband was in jail. Clyde was just out of jail at the time, raging against the Texas penal system. Their crime spree that ensued was spectacular, but the conditions in which their families lived in West Dallas, still unincorporated except for Cement City, reflected the conditions of poor and unemployed people moving to the city, conditions exacerbated by the financial depression of the 1930s. But despite Bonnie and Clyde, there were plenty of hardworking, stable families who immigrated to Dallas in the early 20th century. And the new migrant families brought new cultural and religious traditions to Dallas, as well as reinvigorating older religious communities. Mexican migrants brought their own traditions of Catholic faith. 
and they were so increasingly important that the Cathedral of the Diocese of Dallas, originally dedicated as the Cathedral of the Sacred Heart, was eventually renamed the Cathedral Shrine of the Virgin of Guadalupe, the symbol of popular Mexican Catholicism. Greek migrants to Dallas founded the Holy Trinity Greek Orthodox Church in 1915. And in 1954, Eastern Orthodox Christians of Slavic traditions organized the St. Seraphim Congregation that would become a cathedral of the Orthodox Church in America. Protestant families in Dallas, often led by pastors who migrated from elsewhere in the United States, founded new Presbyterian, Baptist, Lutheran, and Methodist congregations Pentecostal churches, and independent evangelical churches in the decades of the early 20th century. Conservative Protestant leaders who came to Dallas spawned a distinctive group of churches in this period. C.I. Schofield, a St. Louis native who served as pastor of Dallas's first congregational church, authored an annotated Bible, the Schofield Reference Bible, that was for decades the best-selling book from Oxford University Press. He taught that biblical history must be understood as divided into particular ages or dispensations. His perspective is represented by Bible churches in the Dallas area, including the Schofield Memorial Church. Progressive religious leaders in this era also played a critical role in the development of the city. West Texas native George Washington Truett, the pastor of First Baptist Church, inspired the idea of Baylor University Medical Center in 1903, an institution he envisioned as a great humanitarian hospital, one to which men of all creeds and those of none may come with equal confidence. A Methodist physicist born in Georgia, Dr. Robert Stuart Heyer became the founding president of Southern Methodist University when the university was chartered in 1911. And by the early 1960s, in the wake of the Kennedy assassination, Ukrainian native Levi Olan, the rabbi of Temple Emmanuel, had emerged through his weekly radio broadcasts as a progressive public voice of conscience for the city. The fifth wave of migration into the Dallas area consisted of global migrants, arriving after the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965, bringing a complex blend of new migrants. The Immigration Act of 1965 has had a significant impact on immigration to the United States and to the Dallas area more particularly. It is the act responsible for the family reunification policy with which we are, have been living uh, ever since that time. There was some tinkering with immigration law, but not very much until 1952. Uh, and then I think the civil rights movement, the women's movement, um, a sort of liberalization in our policy, the call of President John F. Kennedy, uh, all of that sort of been held forward to the 1965 Immigration Act, uh, which was ultimately signed by President Lyndon Johnson sort of an altered policy towards reopening the doors to immigration and being true to what we were as a country. Census figures in the late 1990s and early 2000s show the foreign-born population of Dallas County doubling every decade from 1980, when only 3% of Dallas County residents were born outside of the United States, to 1990, 6%. And then to 2000, when almost 12% were foreign born. In the same period, between 1980 and 2000, the black population of the county doubled and the Hispanic population almost tripled. By the year 2006, Dallas County no longer had any racial majority. In the year 2000, the largest numbers of foreign born migrants to Dallas County had been born in Mexico, El Salvador, Vietnam, and India. What's different about immigrants to Dallas County since 1965 uh, is, first of all, the huge expansion in the number of the foreign born in the city of Dallas. Secondly, I think people think that somehow prior to 1965, there was already a large Mexican population. In fact, it was relatively small uh, until the 1970s, and it has really grown rapidly uh, since then. And then thirdly, I would say just 
everybody from all over the world was in the city of of, of Dallas, and that uh, even though we had a whole a deep history of immigration and people from all over, mostly Europeans, uh, we really are a, a very diverse city now, which a lot of residents of the city of Dallas don't really fully appreciate. Immigrant groups have tended to settle in ethnically and linguistically defined enclaves, and by the year 2000, these enclaves had spread to the Dallas suburbs. This was especially evident in the Hispanic population of the county. In 1990, people identifying themselves as Hispanic were still residing in West Dallas, a small part of the old Little Mexico neighborhood, and a small area in East Dallas. But 10 years later, the Hispanic population was undergoing a dramatic expansion into the Dallas suburbs, including Irving, Carrollton, Farmers Branch, Richardson, and Garland, as well as the southeastern suburbs of the city of Dallas. To take one example, the Dallas suburb of Richardson has spawned multiple immigrant enclaves in recent decades. An area called Little India has restaurants and clothing stores reflecting the cultures of the Indian subcontinent. Not far away is Chinatown, a shopping mall with Korean as well as Chinese restaurants and shops. Close by is an area of Middle Eastern shops and restaurants near the intersection of Richardson's Main Street and North Greenville Avenue. On the east side of Richardson, extending into Garland, is an area with Vietnamese businesses and the Vietnamese Community Center. And then scattered throughout these enclaves are Mexican and Central American shops and restaurants. Middle Eastern migrants founded enclaves in the northern suburbs of Dallas County. Ethiopian and Eritrean migrants have clustered in northeastern Dallas. The extensive apartment complexes in the Vickery Meadow area have become a landing place for African as well as other immigrants. Dallas's migrants in this period are also leaving their marks on cultural and religious life in the city. Dallas Muslims organized the first mosque in the city in the 1970s, and since that time have founded at least six more mosques in Dallas County alone. The city and its suburbs now have Hindu temples and Buddhist temples and centers. Newly arriving migrants also founded Christian congregations reflecting their own ethnic and cultural traditions. Armenian migrants organized the St. Sarkis Armenian Orthodox Church in the 1970s. Egyptian and African migrants founded the St. Philippatir Coptic Orthodox Church, and the Deborah Baron Ethiopian Orthodox Tewahedo Church. These three churches are of the Oriental Orthodox Christian traditions, historically separate from Eastern Orthodox churches. Indian Christians of the ancient and separate Martoma tradition organized the Martoma Church of Dallas in 1973. Christians of the Assyrian tradition, another distinctive Eastern tradition, are just now organizing a congregation in Dallas. In addition, Korean migrants to the Dallas area founded Methodist and Presbyterian congregations that followed the customs of those denominational traditions as they had evolved in Korea. This fifth wave of migration to Dallas is still in process. It's a story that cannot yet be fully understood, and many questions remain. Can we identify more specific groups of migrants that are distinctive of Dallas in this period? Not just countries of origin, but do our migrants arrive from very specific places, for example, within Mexico or El Salvador or Ethiopia? And why have specific groups of migrants chosen specific areas in the Dallas area for settlement? For example, why have Middle Eastern and East Asian migrants chosen to settle in Richardson? We should ask these questions because we know that for long stretches of the past, migrants have arrived here not just from a large or generic place as Germany or the Middle East, but from very specific places with very specific folkways and they have arrived in this place with its own evolving folkways. So, the Réunion settlers arrived in Dallas in 1855, and here they met the second wave of African American and British American settlers. And a decade or two later, they greeted the newly arriving third wave of German and French migrants, 
and then the Catholic churches their families had developed eventually incorporated the refugees from the Mexican Revolution who arrived in the early 20th century in the fourth wave of migration into Dallas. These five waves of migrating peoples have made the Dallas area the distinctive place it is today. Their descendants remain here, and all of us drive by signs of their presence every single day.